He is one of Trinidad and Tobago's greatest sons. An Olympic silver medalist, an Olympic bronze medalist, a top economist. And through his leadership, this country navigated some turbulent economic times as well as avoided some financial storms. Through a series of strong decisions by Wendell Motley, this country emerged from the 1990s with a bright future. Now, two decades later, as the sun sets on the fossil fuel era, what would be the advice from this former finance minister? This is Viewpoint. Mr. Wendell Motley, welcome to Viewpoint. My pleasure being here. You reached the pinnacle of sport, the pinnacle of academia. You won an Olympic silver, an Olympic gold, an, an Olympic bronze, that should be. Uh, you went to Yale University, you went to Cambridge. You did something special in terms of reaching the pinnacle of both sport and academia, something rare in our society. How did you manage that? Well, I had, Brian, a lot of help along the way. So even in the early days of my sporting career, I had sports masters at QRC who saw something in me, but also alumni at QRC who would come back and train me. And I, too, was just a lucky guy in that at a critical moment, um, Someone from Loughborough College came, saw me, and said he knew somebody at Yale. Um, why don't I apply? And not knowing the odds, I applied and got in. And life has not been the same since then. After your retirement, you went into politics. You served as Minister of Housing. Later on, you would serve as Minister of Industry, Commerce, and, and C Consumer Affairs. Were you always interested in, in politics? I was always interested in international affairs and, quite frankly, always something of a nationalist and wanted to see Trinidad progress. Um, my thesis for my master's at Cambridge was on Trinidad's industrial development. So I've always been interested in the country and how it might go forward. So that when the opportunity came, I, I seized it. You talk about Trinidad and Tobago progressing. Perhaps your greatest impact was not as those two ministers, but rather as Minister of Finance, in which you started in 1991. Um, you know, you were part of that historic team that uh, saw the flotation of the dollar. Um, what was it like to be part of that team? And that was one of Trinidad and Tobago's most crucial moments in our history. Yes, Ryan. It was during a difficult period. You remember we had come through a period of severe adjustment. We were in the Paris Club, um, IMF at our doorstep, etc. And that period when I was Minister of Finance, I recognized that to be successful, you couldn't be a soloist. You had to be a team player. So my role really then was like the conductor of a very large orchestra and to recognize that you had to work with several talents in order to be successful. So that, for instance, um, I worked with very closely with the governor of the central bank during the flotation. I had to work closely with people like Dunbar McIntyre at Republic Bank, Suresh Maraj at City, and so forth. Because once the decision was taken, you weren't the executor. It was the central bank working with the commercial banks and so forth that were required to work the system and, and build the confidence. Before that moment in our history, the Trinidad and Tobago dollar was pegged to the US dollar. Before that, it was pegged to the pound still in post-1978, if I have my years right. How difficult a decision was that for you? How major a decision was that for you? What was the thinking behind it? Again, it wasn't my decision alone. We had discussed this. Um, my former Cambridge colleague, Eurek Bob, my ex-Central Bank governor, we discussed these things. Um, Lenny Safe, we discussed these things. And 
the decision and the timing was left to me. But it was a collegiate decision. I don't want anybody to believe that I floated off one Monday morning and decided to float the Trinidad dollar. It wasn't like that at all. It's still a big, big topic of discussion here in Trinidad and Tobago. When it marked uh, two decades back in 2013, there was a huge uh, there was a huge seminar on it with a discussion and a debate on the Trinidad. What, what do you make of it? Is it now time, given the current economic climate, you still follow it uh, as, as I do, is it now time to reevaluate the TNT dollar? I believe that Trinidad is going through and faces uh, a number of quite revolutionary changes that are ahead of us. And everything has to be up for discussion and formulation of new policies and so forth. Um, and again, when we floated the dollar, at the same time, John Andrews was negotiating new fiscal regimes for the oil and gas industry. It was then Amoco in particular. Um, Prime Minister Manning was head of the energy committee with Ken Julian promoting new investments at Point Lisa so that come to a stop so that we were firing on all cylinders simultaneously to make the dollar successful. The dollar would not have been successful in the absence of all of these things going on at the same time because when I say um, you're not a solo player, Economics is part science, part social science, but a lot of it is emotion and confidence. And you have to get the sweep of the country understanding what you're trying to do and to get the whole orchestra playing in tandem. And that's what we successfully did back when we floated that dollar back in the early 1990s. You talk a little bit about the Point Lisa's industrial estate. A major part of your leadership in this country also saw the emergence or re-emergence, whichever one you want to call it, of the Point Lisa's industrial estate into what it would be in the new millennium. Yes, I was the first executive director of the Point Lisa's Corporation, which was the brainchild of the South Chamber. Mm -hmm. um, guys like Bobby Montano, Krishna Ryan Singh, Sidney Knox, um, Hugh Gransall, they had a vision. And because of my interest and their knowledge of my interest in development, and industrial development in particular, it was a natural fit for me. What do you make of, of South now, having since the late 1990s into the new millennium, 2000 uh, to present, we've lost the sugar industry, we've now lost Petrotrin, ArcelorMittal is packed up and gone. It's, as I say, a number of circumstances are bearing down on us. Right, that we have to really examine closely. On the social front, we have the breakdown of communities, alienation of large sections of the population, retreat into gangs. We have criminality that we know about domestic, but also international, East European, Chinese elements, and now South American elements. And then on the economic front, the fossil industry that has served this country so well for a hundred years, there is a sunset. Um, we face immediate difficulties because shale gas in the United States is now under $2 per MCF. And the contracts that the upstreamers have with NGC are inconsiderable um, in excess of those shale gas numbers. So our competitiveness is being drawn into question. And then sunset, because they say 2040, 2050, fossil fuels have to go for the survival of the planet. And people like Bill McKibben and so forth, there's serious agitation to make sure that this happens. Um, so we have to rethink our energy industry. Um, young Trinidadians are thinking of what we carry into the future, wind power, uh, solar power, these are things that we have to reshape our economy because that fossil fuel industry has served us very well. When you think of 
the amount of foreign exchange that we've had and how Trinidadians spend the foreign exchange unwittingly as to where it sources, which is really Shell, PP, EOG, BHP. That's where our foreign exchange comes from in the large numbers that allows us to go into Price Mart and Massey stores and so forth and purchase the way we do. So with those serious changes coming about, we really have to rethink. And then, of course, um, the, the problems of the implosion in Venezuela, the impact on us, um, great power plays now in our region and our doorstep, and the effects of climate change, you're seeing flooding in the south, that is the new norm. All of these things imply that business as usual in Trinidad, the moment for business as usual is dead. We really have to be thinking how we reprogram for the future. You mentioned rethinking. Coming up on Viewpoint. Can the Point Lisa's industrial estate survive, the model survive in 2020? Point Lisa's industrial estate survive, the model survive in 2020? We have been working very hard, myself included, to try to stretch out the existence of that model, to give us time to do the rethinking and the reworking that is necessary. And I'm confident that we have succeeded in building ourselves some time. There is, however, with the crisis, a lack of trust and between the parties, and we somehow have to bring those parties together and reinstill trust if we are to gain the time for what is necessary, which can't happen overnight. You say that it, we're now in the sun, and many people agree that we're now in the sunset of the fossil fuel era. If you were Minister of Finance now, how would you diversify our economy heading into 2050? Well, again, the Minister of Finance cannot diversify the economy. What would be your advice he to has, the government? You have to be the conductor of an orchestra. You cannot be a soloist. You really have to involve all of Trinidad. They need to understand where we are. Anytime Trinidadians don't understand the basis of their spending at Price Mart or Massey, we're in trouble. I am not sure that the population sufficiently understands the predicament that, that, that we face. So we have to go through an education process so that people understand the necessity of what we have to do and the measures that it will take to be successful. I also just want to, as we're on the energy sector, I also just want to touch very quickly on that part of the team that you were as well, uh, to bring liquefied natural gas to this country. I believe it was in 1998. That led to prosperity at unprecedented levels for this country. Yes, um, those discuss discussions started um, when I was Minister of Finance. Barry Barnes was Minister of Energy. Manning, clearly, as an energy man himself, understood the implications and worked as a team to make those things possible. So that when uh, the players came in from Boston and so forth, selling this idea, at the same time Venezuela had its Cristobal Colon project for vast um, LNG plant, we were in competition. But because we were a coordinated team, working closely with the Americans who had this vision of turning that Boston harbor into the source of energy from Trinidad. Amoco then was a little bit skeptical about it. Um, but David White at the time, head of Amoco, um, persuaded by Ken Julian and so forth, um, eventually caught on. And we worked splendidly as a team to bring off that investment in competition with Venezuela, we won hands down. 
What do you make of the LNG sector in 2020? Just before that, let me make a point. LNG was conceived in the Manning regime and executed flawlessly by the Pandey regime that succeeded it. It tells you something about the duration of these investments because and the need, therefore, for continuity of policy. Because the, the, the country, the growth of the country yielded significantly for decades to come, of, of, of roughly two decades following the, the introduction of energy. And the vast resources that brought us, that causes us to believe that we can continue to spend the way we have. But, you know, we've become arrogant. Um, Ryan, any time that arrogance builds and you see Trinidadians saying, you know, tell Mr. Mittal to take his effing steel mill and go, or you tell um, BP to take your rig and go, you need to understand we're not understanding where we are today. We're still thinking that we were back in the prior to 2010 period. Let's talk a little bit about your political life. You formed your own political party. What was the thinking behind it? It was naive in that, you know, I felt that the country needed to come together. And uh, that opportunity of finding a third way, I thought, was the way forward. Not understanding the deep roots in the two parties and the interest in a third party, but fear that it could be a vote splitter on either side, and therefore people running back to the center. Um, but the genesis remains the same, and especially true today. The nature of those problems that I earlier described to you in the economy, the social situation, the Venezuela implosion, the external forces, um, geopolitics, climate, not gonna be solved by any one party. We really have to find a way to come together to deal with this um, impending situation. Quite frankly, out there you can sense a sense of urgency in Trinidad. People are not well educated but as to the situation in Trinidad, but they're aware that something new has to be called forth. And as well, in wider than Trinidad coming together. We also need to come together in the wider Caribbean. Um, there's a sense as well that individually in this new situation, we will fail if we are just solo players. Did you have a relationship with Mr. Manning in the, his last few years? Um, we became a little bit distant, but I respected him. Your own political aspirations, uh, mm -hmm. do you think if you had re remained in the PNM that you would have eventually become perhaps Prime Minister, as Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley is today? I never look back, Ryan. I took decisions and I live by the consequences of those decisions and I can't say, quite frankly, that it's turned out um, badly for me. Um, I think that I have been able to see an international and bring a global perspective that I otherwise might not have been able to. Um, really, right now in Trinidad, we cannot afford to be insular, and we need some global perspectives. What do you make of Minister of Finance coming, but you're a former Minister of Finance yourself? I don't want to comment on that. I mean, Colm has a difficult situation, and I don't want to comment on his term. Let history be the judge of that. When we come back on Viewpoint, a controversial moment at the 1964 Olympic Games, which Wendell Motley saw with his own eyes. In your opinion, is that the right platform to protest social issues, injustices that may be going on in countries? remarkable things in the sporting arena. You've won an Olympic silver, an Olympic bronze at the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games. Coincidentally, 56 years later, 
The Olympic Games is going back to Tokyo. If not, if not, <laughs> awful thought. <laughs> You know, I've been around long enough to see the Olympics <laughs> revert to Tokyo. <laughs> 1964 was perhaps your biggest sporting moment. Uh, where does it rank for a man like you who has achieved so much in life? Where does 1964 Olympics stand in your history books? That and the, um, the relay um, where we broke the world record stays in my mind. But I will also tell you, um, I look back at those terrace bodies um, at the 2017 IAF Games and to see that Trinidad team um, beat the USA, uh, that, that was a wonderful moment for all of us. Man. You admitted to me over the phone that you, uh, you don't necessarily keep up too much with world athletics these days. Yes. I stay interested, but... I have not stayed within the Athletic Federation or anything, I, but uh, I, I can tell you I've played that um, 2017 really several times <laughs> over. Where did your passion for athletics come from? You seem to be a young man so much involved in academia. Where did this passion for athletics come from? My father. Come? My father, um, Adrian Motley, was a member of the athletic association here. So he would take me to meetings and, and say, I think I could beat those guys. And you know, that little passion started to burn and I set my mind to it and um, don't like being beaten. So that's always stayed with me. How did you manage to excel and to keep your head on for both sport and achieving everything you achieved in sport and also went on to get a master's at Cambridge and before that Yale B. I worked hard. I mean, you had to make choices. You can't do everything. And so I had to stick with the sports and stick with academic, especially at Yale, which was a challenge. Um, so to stay on challenge because you went out to train every day between 2 and 6 in the afternoons and come back for dinner and then have to do your work. And then on weekends, you either had a home meeting or travel, and you're going up to Harvard or wherever else. So you had to be disciplined. You know, you talk about social issues a lot. 1964 Olympics had its social issues, as you would very well remember. Over a half a century later, we're heading back to Tokyo for the Olympic Games, and there are a host of social issues plaguing the world. You look at what's going on in America, you look at what's going on in Europe and Brexit. You know, can we expect another John Carlos moment? I am not sure. The Olympics are always What did you make of it? Uh, being at the Tokyo Olympics, what did you make of, of, of that moment in, in Olympic history? Well... At the time, I didn't think too much of it, but of course, you read about it afterwards and you see the consequences. You see the consequences for the white athlete who went along. You see the consequences for those Americans in America who brought the system. Um, people paid prices. And, uh, you know, in history, we look back, um, but people don't understand that it takes courage and uh, you always have to be prepared to pay the price. Is that the right platform? Because there are already warnings, Mr. Motley, from several Olympic associations and organizations about protesting at the Olympic Games. In your opinion, is that the right platform to protest social issues, injustices that may be going on in countries? I am a purist, and I th believe in the Olympic spirit and I don't want to see the games used politically because it will lead to the destruction of the games. You remember that moment in Munich as well um, with the Israelis being shot. That's the ultimate step. And if we use the Olympics for some sharp protests that catch the eye, but if it becomes too ingrained, it will destroy the spirit of the Olympics and destroy the movement. Do you have plans of returning to Tokyo for the 
2020 Olympic Games? Would very much like to do so. Would very much, and, and planning to do so, I hope that the team, uh, Edwin Roberts, Skinner, Bernard, etc., we're all hoping that we might be able to a find a way sorts. to get there, a reunion, and to get there, and of course to encourage uh, the very fine Trinidad team that, that, that we have, to bring a sense of history, and hopefully for them to build on that. You are an excellent athlete at Yale University. Uh, so was Edwin Roberts, who ran in America as well. He was approached to run for the United States, were you? Yes. Um, my coach at Yale, Bob Keaton Gack, ultimately became the head United States coach. And uh, I, there was no secret. I mean, he would have liked me to have run for the US. He invited me out to train with the US team in California, which I did. Um, but I have always felt that Trinidad is my home, and uh, I think that um, I made the right decision. Mr. Wendell Motley, thank you very much for being on Viewpoint. We really appreciate you. My pleasure.